This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Ramika Vincent Leary and welcome to this edition of In Studio. What can we do to bring sunshine to the lives of those who have faced rainy days? Helping hands can come in many shapes, forms, and fashions. During this edition of In Studio, we'll explore four local agencies that have made it their mission to help the storm clouds of life go away. Their efforts are far reaching, so you may be wondering, what can you do to help? Stay with us, you'll find out more right after this. Welcome back everyone. During this edition of In Studio, we'll be speaking with representatives from several life-changing organizations, the Waterfront Rescue Mission, United Way of Escambia County, and Pensacola Habitat for Humanity. But first, we'll focus our attention on Mana Food Pantries. I'm happy to welcome the organization's Executive Director, Dee Dee Flaunlacker. Now joining her is Kathy Dunnigan, a dedicated board member. Welcome to both of you ladies. Thank you. All right, looking nice, bright, and vibrant this <laughs> evening. So Dee Dee, please give us an overview of the organization. Well, MANA has been in the community for 35 years, and in that time we've provided food to the hungry. We provide it in the form of groceries, right now providing five days worth of food to everyone through a, a grocery bag that actually is using USDA standards for a healthy diet in order to pack those bags. Speaking of which, expanding a little bit on the pantry services program, let's say I'm in need of food. I'm very hungry. Many students, for that matter, here at PSC, for example. It's hard to study and do your work when your stomach's growling, right? It is. Absolutely, and so that's why we've actually branched out even beyond our pantry services to do partnerships and programs with other organizations in the community. So at our pantries, we actually have three pantries, two in Escambia, well, I'm sorry, one in Escambia and two in Santa Rosa. But then we also have other partnerships and programs like uh, Tummy Bundles, where we're working with Boys and Girls Clubs in United Way of Escambia County to reach those children who do struggle to have enough food to eat on the weekends. Um, and so we have lots of different programs tar targeting really gaps in service in our community. So would an individual go to your website, someone in need of food? How Absolutely. Would that work? Now, what they would do, uh, if someone is in need of food, the best thing for them to do is actually give us a call at 850-432-2053. And then we can actually direct them to the best way to get connected with us. Um, we have our pantry here in Escambia County that's open uh, throughout the week, and then also again in Milton two days a week and in Jay as well. I'll be back with you in just a moment. So speaking of food, Kathy, pick a bowl, fill a bowl, right? What can we put in our bowls? Is, Tell us about that. Oh, you are going to put some of the best soup that you've ever had. Um, last year we had about 17 restaurants helping us um, and it was just incredible. Pumpkin lobster bisque. Um, oh, goodness, I'm thinking about that right now. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is delicious. So, but it, this is an event that we are um, well, this will be our 11th year when we do it in September, and we do it right here on campus. Um, we're we're going to do it in the Ross Center on okay. September 7th, um, and it's pick a bowl, fill a bowl, and you literally, you pick out a beautiful handmade bowl that's made by different artists here in our community, um, and then you go in and you get to sample all the food that we have from the different vendors that help you know, with this fundraiser. I could imagine lines wrapped around the entire building. Um, do you know when we held it here at the studio, it was. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have enough room to get into Studio A, so we used to have to have them in line. We moved to the Ross Center last year where it's larger. Uh, we could have more food in there. It was fabulous. So. We had everyone just talking and... Enjoying themselves. And eating and eating and eating. 
All right, let's talk about our senior citizens, many of whom might have mobility issues. Can you expand on the services that you have for them? Absolutely, and you know, there's there are many seniors in our community and across the country who struggle to have enough food to eat. And so they do have mobility issues, transportation issues as well. And so we have a couple of programs that are outreaches for our senior citizens. We actually collaborate with Westminster Village, who is a low-income senior housing facility where we've identified with them about 160 seniors that each month we provide the equivalent of 10 days worth of food to. Now these are, many of these folks are people who are having to choose between buying food okay. or buying medication. Um, many of them were actually taking a pound cake, for example, and that would be breakfast and lunch for them. So now, thanks to MANA and this collaboration, we're able to provide healthy food for them to eat 10 days a week, and, uh, or 10 days, 10 days a month. Right, right. And it's a great collaboration because the Westminster folks come over and pick the food up from us, and they actually distribute it right there at Westminster Village. That is phenomenal. And I think about the children that you help, many that might be on the free and or reduced lunch program at school, but then they get home or maybe even on the weekend and there's not enough food. You know, there are so many people in our community who don't realize, but tonight, one in four children will go to bed hungry. And in Scandia and Santa Rosa counties, one in four kids. And that's just hard for all of us, I think, to wrap our heads around. And so last year, MANA provided food to 20,129 people of that there were over 8,000 children that we see to help. So that's why we do out, outreach with Tummy Bundles. Yes. And Tummy we bundles. also do something with the Santa Rosa County School District where the, we are helping them provide food, the equivalent of seven meals on the weekends, um, to kids in their unaccompanied youth program. And, and there are so many children in need. So Backpack for Teens, mm -hmm. that program. Yeah. I can imagine kids with beautiful backpacks and some snacks in there. Are there supplies in there as well? Well, some what supplies? we do with the Backpack for Teens, and I'm, I'm glad you asked about that because that name is so misleading. Um, actually, what it is, it's a program for unaccompanied youth. Most of these are teenagers who okay. are homeless. And they're actually living on the streets, they're living in parks, in their cars, or they're couch hopping. And so what we do is provide the equivalent of seven meals to them on the weekends. And we distribute through uh, Santa Rosa School District and through a vendor of theirs, a private vendor, Sodexo. And so it's really a great partnership, private partnership, uh, private public partnership. Um, we've got right now about 50 kids that are enrolled in that program for every weekend. That's amazing. So Kathy, as a board member, take us back to your first day at MANA Food Pantries. Oh, first day at MANA. Um, well, I used to go to MANA, I actually used to attend Pickable Fillable all the time, and that's how I really mm -hmm. Okay, we're enlightened, yeah, per when se. They, they used to hold the event at the old facility where they had gardens there, um, and uh, you got to see all the different things, the food in the warehouse, the gardens, the growing, the composting. Um, and I just, I loved it. And I actually, I talked to one board member. I said, you know, if you ever need one, this, this is one I, I would like to go on. And so I'm in my second term now with MANA. Now, I know with that smile that you have, which is infectious, by the way, <laughs> that you really rally the troops to volunteer, don't you? Well... That's what, yes, I am. Um, we've, we've got a lot to do with pickable, fillable, so it is rallying. And, um, but we've got a great community here. We so sure people, do. People step up, and we've got people making the bowls. In fact, we've got a bowl throwing party this Sunday at First City Arts, um, and we're going to have fun all day getting clay ready, and, sure and they're going to make them beautiful. And We're I just going to pack the clay. People will go to your website to definitely find out more <laughs> I information hope, I hope about they do. that. So let's talk about the Gulf Coast Kids House and the Santa Rosa Kids House, mm -hmm. Dee You know, what we believe at MANA is that when someone comes to us and need help, needs help with food, that's only one of many problems that they have. And what we really want to do is try to work with organizations that are addressing those other problems. Well, Santa Rosa Kids House and Gulf Coast Kids House are a great example of a gap in service and also meeting where the need is. 
We found out from Gulf Coast Kids House that they would actually have situations where um, advocates would work with families. The child would suddenly be placed in the household. Uh, obviously, it happens uh, immediately and suddenly. But that family may not have enough food to eat. And so then that puts more pressure on the child. It puts more pressure on the folks who are taking the child in. So now we provide food bags, actually, at the facilities with Gulf Coast Kids House and Santa Rosa Kids House. So that if a family comes in and that's an, an immediate need that they have, we can remove that um, that one stressor, yes, right? Absolutely. And so that is so important. We love those partners and the work that they do. And they're case managing those children and their families. I would like to hear a story. Either one of you can chime in. A momentous story regarding a volunteer. Well, I'll do that, if okay, that's okay. Um, no. So, and I want to say that last year we had 6,892 volunteers that gave over 16,000 hours of service. So we're a small staff of only eight full-time employees. So folks like Kathy and our operational volunteers are just critical to what we do. We, as many people know, had a major flood in April of 2014 and affected our community. Yes. Devastated our organization. We were completely flooded, lost all of our food. Um, it was a horrible situation. Well, the second day after the flood, and by the way, we were only closed for one business day after that really? flood, one business wow. day. So the second day after the flood, we were open um, and we had volunteers coming in, uh, or we had staff coming in. And one of our volunteers, Mr. Bill, who's in his 90s, Bless um, his heart. he showed up. Now, we have sewage that was part of the flood that's drying in the parking lot. We have no electricity. I mean, it's a, horrid, a horrible condition. Mr. Bill shows up and says, put me to work. I'm ready to go. That's the spirit. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And Mr. Really Bill is. represents so many of our volunteers who, you know, just they have the heart and the spirit to help those in need. He thought nothing about coming down and rolling his sleeves up. I told him he couldn't because it wasn't safe. All right. <laughs> Safety <laughs> But first. he was very inspirational, and he's just one example of thousands of folks that help us out. All right, Kathy, final words of wisdom for our viewers out there. Manna is such a wonderful program. The help that we do in the uh, two counties, um, it, I'm impressed by yes. it. Um, it's why I stay and work with them. Um, I love the growth that we've had, our different programs, tummy bundles. Um, those were not around five years ago. So I love the growth and that we're specializing and really finding the needs in the community, such as the seniors, such as the teens that need help. Um, I just, I can't say it's enough emotional. about, yeah, it, it's it really is. And I, we just, you know, we love the support and, um, and Dee Dee has been our fearless leader. <laughs> <laughs> and we seem to follow her. <laughs> All right. From, from building and flood to flood. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Ladies, many thanks to both of you. Now, folks, as we head to break, get those pens and pencils ready to find out more about Mana Food Pantries, including how you can become a volunteer. Log on to the website, www.manahelps.org. Don't touch that dial. We'll be back in a moment. Join WSRE and the Ouncer Prevention Fund of Florida for Pensacola's first annual Be My Neighbor Day, Saturday, April 21st from 10 to 2. Meet Daniel Tiger and Katerina Kitty Cat and sing along with PBS Kids co-host, Mr. Steve. Meet friendly neighbors like local first responders, discover parenting tips and resources, and enjoy lots of kid-friendly fun. Be My Neighbor Day is April 21st at WSRE's Amos Studio on the PSC campus. Admission is free.
Hello everyone. During this segment, we're shifting our focus to the Waterfront Rescue Mission. I'm honored to introduce Paul Stadden, Public Relations Associate. He's joined by Brenda Wilson, an energetic volunteer, including chaplain and program graduate Michael Lawless. I'm thrilled to have all of you on the show. So Paul, can you start by giving us an overview of the mission? Waterfront Rescue Mission is a second chance for a lot of people who don't otherwise have one. People who are addicted to a lot of different things can find a place where they can learn those tools to get over those addictions. Chronic homelessness can be beaten. People who have never filled out a resume or never gone to a job interview can learn the skills they need to to go and get not just a job but a career, a house, a home, a family. I could tell you about a thousand stories. I know we don't have time to do it, but Waterfront Rescue Mission in a nutshell, it's not just a recovery program, it's not just day resources, it's not just an overnight shelter, it's not just meals, it's not just food, it's not just shelter, it's not just clothing. It's everything that we can do as a community to help people who don't otherwise have an ability to help themselves. I'm coming back to you. I'm quite emotional just speaking with you You'll because you have a heart for this. Now, Brenda, Yes. As a volunteer, first of all, what piqued your interest to lend a helping hand? Well, just a little bit of background. My husband and I actually reside part of the year in Missouri. That is Missouri, not Missouri. <laughs> and when we're down here, um, we had the opportunity to be driving around Pensacola and see a vehicle that said Waterfront Rescue Mission. We've been blessed in the last few years. Um, where the Lord has led us to be able to serve in a, on an Indian reservation, um, a birthing home for women. And so we decided we better check this out and see what this was. We come here because we have children in the area. All right. And so what we actually did was, was you know, come to Waterfront and walked in and said, here we are, what is it that you need? What can you, you do? And so they gave us the packets to fill out. And for the last two years, we're down here for about five months out of the year and make it a point to show up at Waterfront. Um, I'm a registered nurse. My husband was an EMT. Um, I'm still licensed. Um, he is not, but we help out in the respite. And right. so if you're interested in that, why let him know. All right. Now, Michael, graduate of the program. First, tell us about the program. All right, for our viewers out there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a drug and alcohol rehabilitation program and it can range uh, from a bunch of different addictions. Um, and so you'll come into the program. It doesn't cost a thing, which is Good. probably one of the best things about the program because a lot of people in those situations don't have the ability to pay for a program. And so you can come into the program, you'll do chapel services, you'll go through classes like addiction recovery, uh, financial management, relapse prevention. And so as you're going through these programs, you're learning the tools and things you need to survive when you leave the program itself. And then the last phase of the program, you'll get a job, you'll start to learn to manage your money so that you can transition out of the program uh, and be an active member of society again. You're also the chaplain, yes. and I know that you've probably prayed with countless people, many of whom may have thought that there was no hope, but there should be hope, right? Absolutely. Yeah, when I actually first came into the program um, as a client, uh, it was I was at my wit's end. I had nowhere else to go. Um, I had actually just gotten out of jail as well, and... I remember not even having an idea of what I wanted to do with my life at the time. And so it was kind of a dark time, but then as you go through the program and progress, um, you start to have hope again, you start to have meaning in your life, and that gives a lot of people the ability to move on. Very good. Paul, can you tell us more about the men's shelters, mm -hmm. Pensacola and Mobile? Well, at any given moment in Pensacola, we're going to have... 170 people sleeping with us that night and that's everybody from somebody who needs a single night of shelter you know maybe they're in a bad way and you know like Michael said you just got out of jail or maybe you just got evicted and you need literally a place to stay you also have people there who are sleeping just discharged from a hospital um, 
some people get that one-way cab fare and Waterfront Rescue Mission is the destination and they're going to be cared for by people like Brenda. You have people who are veterans who have lived homeless, which I don't understand how 15% of the homeless people in Escambia and Santa Rosa County can have one time worn a uniform, defended this nation, and have somehow ended up on the streets. It's a travesty, it really is. It is. So we have opened our doors to people who otherwise wouldn't have a place to stay. In Mobile, it's very similar. You have people, a lot of people who come into the program straight from prison or jail. And you have at any given moment about 45, 50 people staying the night there. These are people who would not have anywhere else really to lay their head. I mean, there are other services in Pensacola, thankfully. Um, but Waterfront, what we really try to do with people who come in addicted is it's not just that you're staying for a night. We're also going to have you meet with a chaplain and try to figure out what's the next step for you because you're probably not staying in an overnight shelter at a homeless shelter because things are going fantastic. So what we're going to do is we're going to meet with you. What's that next step? Can we get you connected with another service? Can we, can we bring you into our recovery program? What can we do to help you get somewhere? Absolutely. Now, Brenda, let's talk about some of the day resources. And I know that you and your husband are doing quite a bit. Well, there is, I mean, there is actually a day resource that um, facility within the um, chapel. And they have access, I mean, they help them with access to computers, to um, being able to charge phones, to being set up with VA, with being able to set up with some of the other um, assistance departments that, that you all have in Escambia County. And like I said, Bud and I work with the, the respite, and to just follow up a little bit on what Paul mm -hmm. was saying, um, you know, we have seen one of the first cases we took care of was without names or, or right. insight, but but certainly was something that we did not from Missouri plan to see in Pensacola, and it was wounds of frostbite. And, you know, you don't think about that. Wouldn't think that that might even occur in this right. area. That's right, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. But we see a lot of people with some of the same things that you would see in any hospital. You know, you have cardiac issues, you have high blood pressure issues, you have diabetic issues, and they are stable enough that according to criteria, hospitals sometimes release them, but they really are not street worthy. Okay. And they really do not have any other place to stay. Absolutely. Michael, let's talk about the Learn to Read program. You graduated from the program. I know that you're reaching back in many ways. Do you have maybe a personal story or two that you would want to share where you saw someone's frown turned upside down? Um, we've, like you said, the Learning to Read program uh, helps some of the people in the program that don't necessarily know how to read and we'll take them to classes. Uh, other organizations actually teach, but we uh, connect them with the organization to help them get there, provide transportation, and then provide them a place to stay while they're going through the schooling. Um, we also have people in the later levels of the program after they're getting jobs and starting to save up and we connect them to uh, actually Pensacola State or UWF or George Stone if they're trying to get back into school, which is um, something that they might not have ever had a chance to do uh, given their circumstances. And so to see somebody who didn't know how to read when they first come into the program and then to get their certificate of completion of the Learning to Read program or even a certificate from another school that they went to, uh, like George Stone and getting a, a certificate from HVAC or from welding, um, something that is just amazing because that's something that they can take with them and provide for themselves afterward. So Paul, back to you. Let's talk about some of the day resources for women. Mm -hmm. I know we've talked about the men. Let's talk about the women for a moment. So Waterfront Rescue Mission, you know, people ask me a lot, you have a men's shelter, you have this men's program, what do you do for women? Well, I, the answer is actually quite a bit. And day resources, if you need a shower, if you need laundry, if you need clothing, if you need toiletries, if you need food, if you need to charge your various devices that you have with you. Because one of the misconceptions I came in with was that I thought that homeless was that guy with the bindle over his shoulder, the pork pie hat okay. with the flap coming off. They have cell phones. They have computers. They have, they're connected. Some have pets, Some right? have pets. So you have all these resources. And we've had women come in with their children. Um, sadly, among the homeless women in Escambia and Santa Rosa County, usually they're the ones who are the ones with the children. 
Um, so we have a lot of bus passes that we provide, a lot of connection to other services that, you know, maybe there's another service that we could connect you to that would be a recovery for your family or a recovery for a woman. And really what we want to do is make sure that they know that they're not alone. That's the main thing that the day resources does. We can provide all these things, but you're going to meet with people who are there because they want to be there and they want to help you because they want to let you know you're not alone. And Brenda, I'm thinking about many of the community organizations out there and I see that you have personal meeting rooms so they can come to you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Talk about they that can. for a bit. Well, they're just our, I mean, there are rooms that they can contact them and make a make a make an appointment to be able to come and meet. They Actually, I have personally been able to stand by as they have done some tours. Um, most recently they had, um, um, and I'm not going to be able to tell you the organization, forgive me, but uh, a group that met and um, was in, in the chapel, actually. And there just are different places where they can actually set that up. Um, I am going to follow up on something for just a second that sure. Michael was talking about. But one of the things that they are working with right now and working very hard with to establish is a program for the EGD. For them. Oh, yeah, the GED. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. What did they go. say? say it That's okay. The, the e equivalency graduate. Yeah, the equivalency right. graduate program. I'm sorry. My, my old, but my bad. But, but they really are. They're working very hard. And so I would, again, say that if, you know, you have um, any interest in seeing some of these people who are trying to step up and go on to become more educated so that they can develop a career or they can whatever, donate time, donate your money. You know, I mean, they have to have somebody to teach. You know, and um, if nothing else, pray for them. Absolutely. You know, um, some of the other things that, that I've touched on is, I'm sorry, this is why, the AED, the automatic defibrillator, we okay. have a lot that are needing, um, have, have the potential for cardiac issues. All right. All right, now, Michael, in a nutshell, a plea out there to anyone to assist, what would you tell them? Well, we are trying to help the community, and this is a community-wide effort, I believe. Um, we, like um, she said, we have needs. Um, we provide services for a lot of people, and that costs a lot of money. And so when we talk about what can the community do to help, uh, it's donating their time, donating their money, donating their uh, energy. Sometimes it's just... We have organizations that come, churches, schools, uh, military groups that come and donate their time. Uh, they provide meals. They provide chapel services. Um, so the big thing is um, I think there's some way that everybody can help, uh, whatever that may be. Um, and that in. is so true. Many thanks to all of you. I've enjoyed having you on the show. So, folks, to learn more about Waterfront Rescue Mission, just log on to the website, www.waterfrontmission.org. Indeed, one person can make a difference, and you can be that motivational force to help others in need. American Graduate is proud to recognize a champion for education. Our mission is to provide girls and young women an opportunity for a better future through education, counseling, training, and advocacy to enable them to become independent, empowered young women and productive members of our society. I didn't want to graduate. I was going to drop out, and then I came to Pace. Frequent discipline problems, uh, family issues that cost them to not be able to attend school regularly, so they had big gaps in their learning. I didn't used to like coming to school, but once I started coming to Pace, it really brought me out to love school. A lot of times we might be that student's confidence until she begins to see her successes and see that she really can accomplish everything that she's come here to do. But education is more than just the academics. It's being able to function in society and be successful there. And we see that with our girls and we love it. Now I'm being a leader instead of a follower and I have people looking up to me to be the best person I can be. Pay Center for Girls is just a beautiful place to be because amazing things happen in the lives of the girls every day, and we're here to celebrate it.
Pace Center for Girls in Pensacola, a positive environment to help young women grow, achieve, and succeed. For more stories of champions, visit americangraduate.org. segment will focus on the United Way of Escambia County and its far-reaching community partnerships. I'm happy to welcome the organization's CEO, Laura Gilliam. She's joined by Kelly Jason, Director of Development, and Donna Edwards, a faithful volunteer. We're so honored to have you here this evening, ladies, and you look so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Laura, let's start with you. 93 years, that's a long time, right? It is. It is. Give us a little bit of history. Sure. United Way of Escambia County has been in this community, serving the community for, like you said, 93 years. Uh, we have been improving the, the health and the education and financial stability of folks in this area for that length of time. We work with lots of community partners. We have, um, have worked to improve the outcomes for individuals in Escambia County, and that work just continues new partners, new ways of doing things. So it's, it's an exciting time for this organization. So Kelly, let's talk about your history and your nonprofit work with the organization. Right. I have um, a history and so, a background in social work. I had worked for funded partner agencies and other agencies that were certified and partnered with United Way. So I was kind of familiar with the name United Way, um, understood that they were doing a lot of great work in the community. But about two and a half or three years ago, I was asked to um, be... Uh, participate in their loaned executive program. And this is a unique program um, where the campaign department lends, uh, depends on volunteers from all throughout the community. So companies lend um, their best and brightest employees and they help um, raise money for United Way. And in turn, these volunteers receive leadership training and they work on their public speaking skills and just find out more about United Way and the work that's being done. And so that was really where I was able to fully understand where the money was going and why it was so critical and why these partnerships were really valuable to our community. And I just fell in love with the work of United Way and all of the individuals who make up the staff and the partner agencies. It's just an inspiring network of so much good that's happening here in our community. So when the opportunity arose for me to join the staff officially, um, yes. it just made sense. <laughs> and it was a very natural fit. Um, so I'm really proud to work on the resource development team um, here at United Way. Love your enthusiasm, <laughs> Donna, <laughs> as a volunteer. Volunteer. Let's talk about Women United. Can you give us some background information on that? I know that you have your hand in a lot of pots per se. I do. Um, so I joined Women United last year and I wanted to be in an organization that was with other like-minded women who wanted to help other people as well as do service work and socialize at the same time. So it's a great combination of getting smart, you know, well-intentioned women together and we meet and have a nice social time as well as doing projects that help people. So for example, your first guest that was here, the very first one I yes. attended was at Mana Food Bank and we, we packed tummy bundles for that <laughs> as one of our Women's <laughs> United efforts. So it's very fun. Laura, your initiatives are far reaching. Talk a little bit about what you do in Escambia County, but there is a worldview, right? Yes, yes. So we, we do, most people know United Way as the fundraiser, and, and we've been doing that, like you said, for 93 years. But we, we've broadened our scope and engage in other work outside of that that's just as effective and impactful. Um, we have a volunteer income tax assistance program, which has a site here at PSC. Good, and good. We, that way we are able to get money into the hands and the pockets of people who are hardworking individuals who may not have been able to access that money otherwise. We have 211. 
which is a free 24 hour a day, seven day a week and program that connects people in need with the resources that are available in the community to help them. So that's just a, a very small list of the many things that we're involved in. All right, back to you, Kelly. Let's talk about health and education. Now you, you know a lot about those two areas. <laughs> Yes, those are certainly two of our pillars. So I believe Laura mentioned that, you know, our main mission is to address the gaps in our community in the areas of health, education, and financial stability. So the work that we do and the work of our funded partners aligns within at least one of those areas. But those pillars certainly don't stand alone, and they're very intertwined. And so we know that, um, you know, having a high school education is going to set you up for a higher income job that probably has health insurance benefits. And when you can have access to those benefits and you go to work and you're healthy, that you're going to be a more productive employee. So all of those really tie together. When you can maintain that stable um, career, then you have that financial stability. You can hopefully save for that rainy day. Um, so all of that is really intertwined. And, you know, we look for those collaborations and those partnerships. And really, we want our partner agencies to be in their niche, you know, stay exactly. where you are an expert exactly. in that field. But how do we connect these partners to one another? How do we connect families to two one one, because what presents as I'm hungry, there yes. probably is a greater need. You know, was that because your work hours were cut and so you didn't have the income in order to purchase your food that month? Well, maybe 211 has some resources that will be available to help that family meet their needs. That's so true. So, Donna, what drew you to the United Way of Escambia County? So I recently relocated to Pensacola from Portland, Oregon, and I had been very active in the nonprofit community in Portland. So I knew I wanted to do that in Pensacola as well. And believe it or not, I was reading the paper and I saw an advertisement in the paper for the United Way wanting volunteers and if you wanted to be active in the board in other areas. So I went to the training that they were doing and that's how I found out about United Way and met the wonderful people there and their processes and got engaged with their programs. Kelly, so how do we get involved? There's so many things that we can do, right? Absolutely. There is a way for anybody and everybody to be involved with the work at United Way, and we would really love to see everybody in this community step up and find the way that's most appropriate for you or your family to be engaged and to help and support one another. So there are three ways that ultimately you could be involved and become a champion for United Way, and the first is through giving, making a financial contribution to United Way. Your workplace may have um, a workplace campaign. I know PSC is wrapping yes, up Yes, we theirs. do. We're wrapping it up. So you all... Um, <laughs> had an awesome campaign here. Um, one of our board members is a PSC um, employee, so I know Patrice Witten helped okay. us out with um, having an awesome kickoff here, a little presentation so that your employees could find out more about the work of United Way, and you held a car wash. That so was really exciting to see um, your employees get energized about giving back to the community um, financially. Um, if you're at a workplace that doesn't yet have a campaign, you can still make a gift, a financial contribution. Our website makes that really easy for you. You can always get in touch with um, our staff. Um, the second way to be involved is through volunteerism, and that's if you have one hour, one time, or you can commit to an hour a week or something more, we can find a project that's going to really align with the skills and passion that these individuals or groups um, are looking for. So we do have a volunteer center, and that's their focus, is to help find the best project that's going to be appropriate for that individual or group that's looking. And the third way to help us is through advocacy, um, just opportunities like these or opportunities to tell somebody what United Way is doing and how we're doing it and who we're helping. Um, the impact is um, so far reaching in this community and it's just inspiring to watch the thousands of people who rally with us each year to support one another and to lift each other up during difficult times. So Laura, let's say I make a donation, right? There might be some people out there that do not realize that there are numerous nonprofits mm -hmm. that receive aid. Can you expand a little on that? Because the dollar is going to go such a long way. Exactly. Uh, first of all, I think it's important for people to understand that there's a very um, intricate process that we go by to distribute those funds. And that process is driven by volunteers. So United Way staff don't make the decisions about the funding. These are people like you um, and Donna who are going out and reviewing applications and making site visits and, and that type of thing. Um, 
we have the, the funding is directed towards programs that agencies are administering. And those programs are working in the areas of improving education, improving health, and ensuring the financial stability of people in our community. And what we make sure is that we are looking for outcomes, not just how many people were served, how many people went through a program, but what happened because they received that knowledge, because they, they completed that class. So it's very important that um, the information that we get back from them is telling us what's happening with their money because the donors want to know that. So, so we have, like I said, we have a very, um, a very well oiled process to distribute the funds and we're looking for those programs that are going to make the greatest impact in the community. All right, so Kelly, tell us about the volunteers that may serve on the committee. Can you talk a little bit about that? Through the um, community investment right. that she's referring to? Yes, we have, I think, about 40 or 50 or so individuals right now. Donna is actually serving okay. on that, so it might be better to defer this question to Donna I as a volunteer. We will defer to <laughs> Donna and <laughs> pick it up. So the investment committee is an excellent process, as Laura was saying. Um, I've served on this, on this committee for three years, and it's very, very good. It's a well thought out and very involved process where each of the applicants submit a proposal that has excellent questions. Um, United Way has already vetted them on certain criteria before it ever comes into that process. And then we as volunteers read through that, get an opportunity to ask questions, and then we go on site visits with every one of the applicants and get to ask more questions, see what's going on in their sites, and then come back. And as a group, we, we then have a clear process as well to talk about how we need to distribute the funds, which is always very difficult. There's always oh, a lot more sure needs yeah. than, there are, than there is dollars, but you really get to understand it much better and understand how you think the dollar that you're gonna be allocating to that particular organization can go the furthest and really see that each of these organizations is helping other people get back on their feet. And you know, it's not the handout, but the hand, hand up and how it really is helping the community. Those helping hands, yep. Laura, Let's talk about a call to action. We have learned a lot during this segment and throughout the entire show. Some words to share with our viewers, a call to action. Well, I think that people wonder if their little bit of money will help. They wonder if just that hour or two will help and whether or not writing a letter will help. Well, all of that does. And, and so I would encourage people to do what they can and to make sure that they get involved. Uh, you know, our work is to improve the lives of the people in this community. And, and whatever people can do uh, is, is important. It makes a difference, you know, when you combine those dollars, when you combine yes. that time with everybody else's, it has a significant impact. And I think that one of the things that, that United Way does in partnership with, our, with the other organizations in the community is to give hope. And I think that's very, very important. And, um, and that's what people do when they volunteer, when, when they donate, they give hope. Absolutely do. Well said, ladies. Thank you so much for being on the show this thank evening. You. So folks, to find out more about the United Way of Escambia County and what you can do to lend a helping hand, log on to the website, www.unitedwayescambia.org. We'll be back in a moment. WSRE Public Television and the Escambia Elementary Principals Association congratulate these Shining Star Award recipients. These students were selected upon the basis of good citizenship and adherence to the core values adopted by the Escambia County School System. Equality, responsibility, integrity, respect, honesty, and patriotism. Congratulations to all of these outstanding students.
there. During this segment, we're shifting our focus to helping hands that are used to build homes for those in need through Pensacola Habitat for Humanity. It's a pleasure to welcome Tim Evans, Executive Director. He's joined by Crystal Scott, Director of Resource Development, and Faith Higgins, Neighborhood Outreach Coordinator. I also understand WSRE-TV has helped in the initiative. So, Tim, please start out by giving us an overview of the organization. Well, Pensacola Habitat for Humanity has been working in this community for 35 years. Our mission is, is fairly simple. Uh, we are a Christian organization, and so our mission starts by talking about putting God's love into action. And when we do that, we bring people together to build homes, community, and hope. And that's really essentially it. It's what we do. So many people know us primarily through the Affordable Home Ownership Program, but it's much more than that these days. We are coming now more towards becoming a, a comprehensive community development organization. Phenomenal. So Faith, let's talk about neighborhood revitalization. Yes. Neighborhood re revitalization, um, a lot of people, um, they are not familiar with that portion of Habitat. Um, it's not quite new. It started in 2010 um, on the international scale, and um, Pensacola Habitat has incorporated it into its model. Uh, we work in neighborhoods to not just in housing, but also to help, under help people understand the importance of economic development, uh, safety, health care, to the sustainability of the community as a whole. So really the focus is to help people understand the importance of how to uh, not just have a house in the community, but the impact of that house and the environment around them as well. So the resident self-help angle, let's say we have someone whose grass is five feet high and they don't realize they should cut it, <laughs> or, or just something simple like that. Are those some of the things that you help them with? Well, we, we want residents to understand the importance of taking ownership of their community, uh, really caring about their environment. So yes, we work with um, different organizations to help them understand the resources that are within the area okay. to, um, to help connect them to you know, those services that can better assist them. All right, Crystal, let's talk about the volunteers. Let's rustle up the troops, right? So how can one become a volunteer? There's a process, right? There is a process. Um, so we pretty much have an opportunity for anyone who's looking to become involved with the community, um, whether you want to assist with uh, building a new home, which most volunteer opportunities are kind of, that's what people know Habitat for. But there's so many other um, situations which you can get involved. Um, we are always looking and recruiting um, even for office volunteers to come in and assist with um, staff, maybe clerical um, opportunities. Um, we are looking for people to become involved in neighborhood revitalization, whether that's painting homes. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, such a broad spectrum of things and we really um, listen to what the volunteers looking and hoping to get out of these uh, experience and um, try and fit them with um, something that's going to you know make the community better as a whole. Is there an age limit? Absolutely so um, to be involved um, on a construction site um, you have to be at least 18 um, but we do work with um, entire family situations um, we really encourage um, youth groups to get involved. Um, the 16 to 18 um, kind of individuals, um, we encourage them to come out after the build is complete okay. and kind of help us with the landscaping and things like that. So, um, you know, we, we like those young, strong folks for the new construction, but there's also opportunities for the younger um, generation as well. Our WSRE TV family sure has enjoyed this for the past couple of years. Yes, Thank yes, you yes. for having us. Yes. So. Tim, back to you. Talk about the social enterprise model. It's, it's a new way for nonprofits really to work in a community uh, that really relies uh, primarily upon the work that the organization does to generate a good amount of support for the organization. We're very fortunate in 35 years of operation, we have built over 1,300 homes. And in the habitat model, we sell those homes at an affordable price point. The individuals or families that buy the homes pay on a mortgage. And okay. so 35 years of selling homes, collecting mortgage funds, we have developed what is called within habitat language a fund for humanity that just rolls over like and over that. and over and over, generating 
ongoing stream of income for the organization. And that's what a social enterprise model is about. An organization that helps the community but does it in a way that to a great degree pays for itself as it goes forward. I like that. Great model. <laughs> okay, so Faith, let's talk about special volunteer opportunities. I know that you work with Crystal yes. regarding this, but let's start with you. Yeah, so it's a great it's a great partnership. We all have different ways volunteers can get engaged. And I think the important thing is not only matching volunteers with their skills, um, but making sure that, you know, if they have expertise in areas that we could use, you know, we're, we're incorporating them in there. So uh, we have uh, a lot of repair work we do under our homeowner occupied repair program, as well as community pride and community development. There's different opportunities for volunteers to get engaged, specifically in the, um, in the community pride. We look for volunteers with, you know, expertise in masonry or different construction um, expertise that would help in really making sure that the projects are done in a skilled and you know really professional way you know we are providing so many opportunities um, for repair work in the community and um, we we never want to think that um, because it is uh, a uh, it is a affordable yes. repair that somehow the quality is somehow compromised in that. So we look for uh, expertise and volunteers and that's one of the areas that, you know, we, we always are looking for more. So. Crystal, women build, faith yeah, build, talk absolutely. about those. So kind of on the other end of that spectrum, um, we are looking for volunteers who have maybe no experience um, at all. Um, we are encouraging um, people to get involved in our special builds. And so throughout the year, we have um, a building on faith initiative um, where faith communities come together um, and build a house. Um, and it's a really amazing experience to see everyone come together for an entire week and basically build build a home for a family from the ground up. Um, our women build um, is a little bit different because um, it's actually women and men, but mainly m women coming okay. together um, and actually raising the funds for a home and providing their time and volunteer, um, volunteering their time and building that house. So um, we just had um, the dedication for the Women Build Home um, this past month. And um, just seeing that process from start to finish is really a, a really cool thing to be involved with. Tim, you talked about affordable home ownership, but there are some new models that are available. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Well, again, in our 35 years, it's always been our desire to work towards constantly improving what we provide to the community. And over the past several years, we have been working to improve both the, the quality of our homes, the energy efficiency of the homes, and most recently working very hard on the curb appeal or the curb aesthetic appeal. of the home. Yes. And our new models these days have a, a kind of a craftsman style look to them, have some raw rock on the posts, mm -hmm. very attractive. To the point in 2016, we entered the uh, local Home Builders Association Parade of Homes. And we won our category in the Parade of Homes for the quality, the design, and the quality yeah. of construction. The other thing that's different for us is we have changed some of the dynamic of the home ownership program. These days, when families come in uh, seeking to, to buy a home through Habitat, they have the opportunity to choose their location, to choose their floor plan, to choose the level of refinement of their home based on the buying power of their household income. Let's talk about licensed mortgage lenders. Sometimes people say, do I qualify? I don't know. Let's help calm some fears here. <laughs> well, and we, we try to help calm fears across the board. When people ask us about our home construction, we build to code. We have to. We're, we're builders in the community. When people talk to us about lending and mortgage lending and, and originating a mortgage through Pensacola Habitat, our organization is licensed by the state of Florida. We have licensed lenders on our staff. And so the service that people get by buying a home through us is the same quality, the same level of profession, and the same level of consumer protection that any licensed mortgage lender in the community offers. All right, so neighborhood revitalization, yes. right, Faith? Absolutely. In both Santa Rosa and Escambia counties. Talk about that, please. Well, you know, we do cover a large region, and I think it speaks to not only the need in the community, um, but the 
uh, the flexibility and really the range that neighborhood revitalization reaches. Um, we have worked so hard to make sure that uh, we are looking at what the community actually needs, working with community partners, uh, local government, and neighborhoods to look at what are they trying to do in their community. Under our community development program, it focuses on blighted areas, areas that need economic development and revitalization. And uh, example, Brownsville community, you know, it was a booming area at one time and it's gone through such a change. So we are working with uh, local leaders to look at how can we reinvest in areas uh, like that, um, as well as bring up and empower local residents to engage in the conversation and um, be the change in their community. So That's so true. The Global Village, Tim. Global Village yes. is a very interesting program. We've been active in this over several years now. What it means is working with Habitat International. There's more work done by Habitat for Humanity outside of the United States than there is work done inside really? the United States. And when, when we take a group of people from our community to go and work for housing solutions for people who are struggling in other communities throughout the world, it just, for us, it just really sets so firm how important housing and shelter and that type of safety and security and stability is for any family. We have had trips that have gone to Cambodia. We've had volunteers go to Fiji and to Argentina. I took a team of 20 to Kathmandu wow. a number of years ago. And, and we are regularly sending teams uh, about twice a year. We have some folks who go down to Guatemala. We've started a great partnership with that uh, country's habitat program. And it is so rewarding for us because what we are able to do with that is develop a stronger base of local volunteerism by doing this international work. Wonderful segment to all of you. I'm excited. Love the volunteerism. Thank you for being on the show today. As we close the show, we want to thank all of our guests for joining us. Now, for more information regarding Pensacola Habitat for Humanity, log on to the website, www.pensacolahabitat.org. I'm Ramika Vincent Leary. Have a good evening, and remember to keep it locked in right here on WSRE PBS for the Gulf Coast.